Hey, welcome back to the Behind the Well Show. This is Roger Abel, your host with co-host Elias Randall. Eli, what's happening today, buddy? Oh, it's another day. I decided to wear one of my beautiful plaid shirts for today. And, you know, a while back I was a plaid planner, but I'm not the plaid planner anymore. But I really, I like this shirt, for, especially in the summertime, so... I didn't even notice yet you, you, you were bringing back the plaid planner day. Yep, plaid planner is um, the first. He he was the first financial planner to exclusively wear plaid all the time. I'm trying to figure out why you switched. I just I'm too grumpy to be the plaid planner. I guess I don't know. I don't know why I switched. Let's talk about today's show. And today's show is going to be a little bit of fun. It takes me back to when I was in high school. And we're going to take a look at uh, some of the funny moments in popular TV shows from the past. And, you know, for me, I remember in high school, this is probably the most popular show on TV and to level set people. I graduated in 1997. And for a long time, I used to think I was still young. But now I'm feeling old as that was over, you know, we're going on 25 years ago. Yeah, you're but, old now. But I mean... With that said, this show's actually still popular. They still run reruns of this. And we're going to talk about Friends today, which was a show that aired from 1994 to 2004. Um, and like I said, it's actually made quite a resurgence on a lot of the streaming platforms today where uh, a lot of younger generations are starting to watch the show. And I think this show was so neat because it just had so many multiple personalities in it. And a lot of the actors and actresses in this show really, you know, turned out to become really big stars. I mean, the biggest one's probably Jennifer Aniston and she's still a big star today. And, and I think that's what makes this show kind of everlasting is people see these other, these actors and actresses in different shows and then they start to learn about who they are, and they're like, well, this is where they started. So they want to go back and see where they actually started. And I'm not sure how much of Friends you watch. You're a little younger than I am. But I remember in high school, uh, there, there was a group of people who'd get together to watch Friends episodes. Every week when yeah, it came weekly, out? Yeah, they would do it. I mean, I wasn't into it like that, but I remember a group of my friend group that was like, hey, every Friday or whatever day it was. I don't even remember the day, but they would get together to watch the new friends episode almost like for me today i don't get together with my friends but every week i try to watch you know certain series is like uh yellowstone when it was out every week i was watching the new episode couldn't wait for it to get out it's kind of the same thing with friends you know back in the day so uh so i i have not seen every single friends episode ever created i've seen some so there's there's one i do remember watching where uh and I think it's some relevant financial content in there, but um, I, I think it's a good lesson where true financial independence means not relying on your parents. And that's something I think uh, is probably more common for the younger generation now, relying on on parents um, for help. And so I think if you remember the if you remember the one where it all began and. Uh, Rachel, she has a bad day at work, which that happens to people, and then she takes a credit card, and I believe it's uh, her her folks' credit card, and goes and buys some boots, which some people do deal with their stress or anxiety or whatever's going on through shopping. I think that's a fairly common thing for people to do. Um, and then the rest of the friend group told her, "Hey, you should cut those credit cards up and not not use them," which. Um, whatever year that came out, I mean, that's still, that's still relevant today. Not using, it's a couple things. One, if you can't be responsible with credit cards, just don't even use them. Don't think about them. Don't have them. Don't use them. Um, you know, and it seems like that seems like common sense, right? It seems easy to understand, but a lot of people kind of fall into that trap. And really, I think what the, the friend group didn't know is she was actually spending, her parents' money. And so we have some data here on people that are getting support from their family. And it could be for whatever reason, you're just getting started with your career. Um, and, and that's another hurdle too, right? If you're just getting started, you have student loans and no one really, very few, 
th- there are professions out there. You start with a nice salary. Most of the time you start with a, you know, an average starting salary. Um, so just to go over the numbers here a little bit. So 34% of millennials are living with their parents and 54% of those are receive are receiving support that, that the value is $500 or less each month. And then of those 18% get about 500 to a thousand. Sometimes financially supporting kids, it does take away from parents ability to save for retirement or to be retired. And some more than others feel obligated for that financial support. But ultimate, I mean, I'm people in the older generation. I mean, they, they seem to do all right and get by without all the extra help. I, and I think a lot of times what you find is there's some help that's necessary. Like you're, you're helping people get to a better spot. I would imagine most of it is irresponsible financial decisions by the younger members of the family, whether it's, um, you know, uh, social life, sports, gambling, just doing things that they truly can't afford to do because they know they have the safety net of, Oh, well, mom and dad will just give me 5,000 bucks, thousand bucks, whatever I need to get by for the next month. Here's what this really reminds me of. And you know, I always have this question, do the kids actually need support or are the parents just choosing to support them? And, and here's why I think about that. I was watching the NBA draft and you know, we're all, you know, we're from Iowa. So we're excited about the NBA draft because we had Keegan Murray who got drafted last year. Chris Murray was getting drafted this year and our office has, you know, some ties to the Murray family, you know, Brock's son um, is really good friends with Chris and Keegan Bull. So I was watching the draft to see where Chris got drafted and literally right before Chris got drafted, Jay Billis, they were doing a segment and they were talking about money and Jay Billis said, you wouldn't believe. And Jay Billis, to back up is like the host of the draft, one of the TV hosts and kind of commentator people that keep it going. And Jay Billis goes, you wouldn't believe how many of these kids are still on their, their, their parents' cell phone plans. The NBA players? In the NBA. And they said, do you want to call anybody out? He goes, no, I'm just saying there's a lot of these guys who are making $30 million who are still on their parents' cell phone plans. And that's why I asked, is, is all of this support that's like, hey, my kid needs the support? Or is it, it's just easier for me to pay the bill and not switch and get them off my cell phone plan and lose a multi-line discount and all of these different things? It's probably just the function of no one wants to take the time to go to the cell phone store and mess with it. So that's why I always look at these studies with, you know, I always look at them with a little pessimistic lens, but it just makes me think how many of these kids actually need support versus are just being offered support. But, you know, here's the other thing that makes me think about Elias is if they're getting support now, and we've heard this from people, we've got this, you know, older generation that has a vast majority of the wealth and the younger generations there's many of them that are just planning on getting an inheritance. Planning on inheritance? Yeah. How many times have we heard it? Well, I'm going to get an inheritance. We're doing a financial plan. Hey, well, I'm going to get an inheritance. And you know what we yeah, tell people who are going to get an inheritance? It. We'll put it in the financial plan when you get the inheritance. And here's the data of why people, I believe, want to tell me they're getting an inheritance. Uh, This is by Prudential. They put out a study that Gen X, one third of Gen Xers have less than $10,000 saved. So they want to tell us they're getting an inheritance so that they don't have to prioritize savings and they can keep up with the lifestyle that their friends have and they see on social media from their other friends and celebrities and all these different people. They want to use inheritance as a reason to not save. And I would imagine their perception of what they will inherit and and the reality are probably two different things. I think that's oh, I I think I have found when people say something like that, um, that they might think that their parents or someone has X amount. Well, they may be one of three or four siblings, even if you're one of two. Well, typically that's, you're not getting the full amount. And then in general, 
I don't know that people are realistic about how much money, unless they know for sure, unless your parents have actually told you, because the, re the reality is we have a much better sense of what the average person has as far as their investable net worth or whatever you want to look at. And it's not, you know, just, it, it's just the truth. The, the vast majority of people don't have several million dollars, right? There's a lot of retired people that have in the ballpark of 1 million to two, um, but there's not just, it's not like five out of 10 people walking around has several million dollars that they can give a million dollars to four or five kids when they pass away. That's just not the reality of, of the situation. I agree with all of that. And in the, the next episode that I, I kind of take the heart and I think that people don't think about too much. And I have enough, a philosophy on loaning money, but really throughout the show, if you watch it, and I watched, I'm not going to say I watched every episode, but I watched a lot of them, and mostly through reruns. Um, Chandler, if everybody rem remembers Chandler, he works a corporate job. I think he was in accounting. But throughout a lot of the show, he was loaning money to Joey, and Joey was his friend. He was an aspiring actor, so we all know people who are aspiring actors. They usually don't have a whole lot of money. I remember when Joey went to Las Vegas, and, you know, he found his identical hand twin. There's just a lot of, like, great shows with Joey, but he never had any money. So Chandler would loan him money. And when we were researching stuff for this show, there was actually a Reddit user who went back through the show and calculated approximately how much Chandler <laughs> had loaned his friend throughout the entire course of the show. And this Reddit user came up with a, a number of $100,000. And what the Reddit user comment is like, we very rarely see Joey pay him back. So I have a philosophy that, and people have asked me about this. Hey, I want to loan my kids money or a friend money. I said, and this is what I tell everybody. If I were you, I wouldn't consider it a loan. I would consider it a gift. And it goes back to my general philosophy of, lowering my expectations of what's going to happen. So if you go in and loan your kid $10,000, you should just expect that it's not going to be paid back. It doesn't cause any animosity, doesn't ca cause hard feelings. You don't have to chase them around for the money. It's a gift. If you want to pay me back, great. But if not, it's a gift. You can't be disappointed. And that's how if you loan money to your friends and family, you should look at it because otherwise I feel like you're setting yourself up for this massive amount of disappointment. Yeah, it's the the way to do it. And we, like you said, like you said, a gift. And I, I think that kind of leads to another episode where, which, and it was kind of a theme of the show where, okay, so there's the friend group, but then they're kind of in two different financial situations where a few of them are making more money. Um, like Ro I believe Ross, Monica and Chandler had like, better jobs, corporate jobs. And then you have Rachel, Phoebe, and Joey are more like, okay, the free spirits and Joey's an actor. I can't recall what the other two do, but they're just more free spirited. They don't have as much disposable income. So then there's times where they want to get a gift. Like I think they're going to go to a Ho Hootie and the Blowfish concert. Some can afford it, some can't. Um, and, and in those situations, or even if it's just – we're all going to go to a fancy restaurant. I feel like if you're someone, if you're one of the friends in a group of friends that knows, okay, I have more disposable income. I want to spend time with them. This is what I want to do. You, one, you can't hold it against them if you spend some money to have a good time with them. And, you know, at some point, does it even really matter? Like if you really want to go to a concert with someone and they can't afford it, but that's what you want to do and you buy them a ticket, is that is that a big deal? So I actually have a friend who he – so if there's a show he wants to go to, he always buys two tickets at least, whether he knows he has someone to go with or not, and then he'll just see if he can get someone to go with him. He might buy four, but always more than one. And – what he does, so if he can't find another friend to go with, as he's, he'll like walk through the scalping area, and if he can find people that want, he won't sell them. He just gives them away. 
So oh, nice. He, yeah, it's a, the first time I saw him do it because I think we had four tickets. Only three of us were there, so he had an extra. And I said, what are you going to do with that extra ticket? And he's like, I always just find someone and I give it away. So we're walking to the show. There's a guy who's looking like he's about to go buy one. And my buddy goes, hey, you want a ticket to the show tonight? The guy's like, yeah, how much? He goes, have a good time. Just gave it to him. Just made the guy's day. So it was one of the cooler things I've ever I've seen someone do it. Now, I haven't implemented that in my own life. I don't buy random tickets for strangers. But um, but I think that friend of mine who does that, his value in the experience is also helping someone else have a good time. Yeah. And that person was obviously – they either planned it late or they weren't expecting to go, but they were going to go scalp a ticket. But or they, they worked got, hard. You know, I'll give you an example. The Matt Reif comedy concert. The thing was sold out in like immediately – yeah. I spent two and a half hours on the computer just trying to get logged into the website. So, so did you get tickets to it? A friend of ours got tickets. Oh, yeah, got us nice. tickets. Um, we had a few different people trying to, to get them. But the cool thing about that is that same person who's scalping that ticket probably spent the whole day trying to get on. They probably couldn't afford to do the pre-sale or they were working so they couldn't sit by their computer for three hours and keep hitting refresh to get in. So he probably made that person's day because it's probably a hard ticket to get. So I, I think that's actually, that's really pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, and I think the kind of the lesson from that theme of friends, you know, in a friend group, there might be some money issues. A one, the, in, in my opinion, money, money shouldn't impact any friendships. And um, I think the other thing is being honest and like upfront about about your financial situation with your friends is going to uh, is going to be the best route. Well, and if every if everyone if everyone does that, then I just think everyone feels a little bit better about the situation. The keys in what you just said, you know, your friends may not know your individual financial circumstance, and depending upon how you hold yourself out, they may believe you have a more successful you know financial situation than you actually do. You know, nobody wants their friends to think they're poor. But in a situation you can't afford the tickets, it's one thing. I know, like, when we do concerts and stuff, we've, we're conscious about the tickets we buy and who would go with us to those concerts. Like, we're not trying to exclude people when we go, but we have a certain, like, friend group that we know, regardless of what we pay for the tickets, they're going to want to go. Because, like, my wife values upfront close great experience versus 10 shows we only go to like we go try to go to like one good concert a year you know we missed a bunch because of covid so we're playing a little bit of catch up but you know we're conscious of who we're inviting we're not going to spend x amount on a ticket knowing that these friends that we are going with you know they might say they can afford it but we don't want to put a financial burden on anybody just to try to go to the concert with us just to have a good time yeah, that's thoughtful of you. You know, but it kind of leads into the next episode that I remember, and I think this actually happens to lots of people, and it's the one where Joey actually moves out. So there's an episode where Joey, you know, he's a struggling actor, and he finally gets his big break on a, and he gets a reoccurring role on the soap opera Days of Our Lives which it's ironic because I remember growing up, my mom would watch Days of Our Lives. Back in the day, they had like, you recorded your, uh, you recorded your TV shows on a, what, I don't even know what they're called. VHS tape? Yes, a VHS tape. So I remember the shows my parents recorded was, uh, my dad recorded Star Trek, and my mom would record Days of Our Lives. That was their soap opera that they watched. So he gets this reoccurring role. And I think like a lot of people, when they get their first big job, the first thing he does is he moved out because now he's getting a regular paycheck. So he probably doesn't need Chandler to float him all the time. Uh, so he gets he a big. Did he start giving some of that 100000 back? No. That never works out. That way. doesn't happen. Why would we pay back the. <laughs> if you think about the debt, the debt repayment schedule in real life, it's bank, credit card, friend. And guess who usually gets cut out? <laughs> Friend, you're the last on the totem pole because there's no recourse. But um, so he moves out, gets into a bigger apartment. He, you know, he uh, he decks it out with all this expensive decor. 
And then guess what happened? He got fired. Lost the job. Yeah. Shoot. And um, he loses his job, and now he's unable to cover the credit card bill from the recent purchase. So he didn't pay cash, right? He used the credit card to do it because he hadn't earned the money yet, but he assumed he was going to. So um, he goes and returns everything that he bought because he can't pay the credit card bill except for Pat the dog, which Ross bought back for $200. But it's a good point of lifestyle creep. Like just because you're getting paid a bunch today doesn't mean it'll be here in the future. And you got to be really careful of lifestyle creep. And we see this happen. And I think the most common place for it to happen is people transitioning from college to their first job. Yeah, absolutely. They, they went from borrowing money to live on. So no positive income to, okay, maybe I'm making $60,000. And what's the first thing every single, not every single college graduate, but what's the first purchase a majority of college graduates go and make right when they're done with school car. There you go. They think they have to have a nice car. Um, and that's great. We need a car, but maybe you should get in the job a little bit, save up the money, see how long you're going to be at this job. See how much you like this job before you go commit to buying the new car. You know, this might be a little bit of a exaggerated illustration, but we see people all the time who annually they get a raise, right? Hey, you get a three or 4% raise, whatever it is. In reality, how many people give themselves a pay raise when they get the raise at work? When you say give yourself a pay raise, like increase your savings? Yes. Um, well, the our finan- clients do the financially savvy do right, but not many. They only think about it. They just say, "Hey, I got a four percent raise, so I get more money." They don't go in and say, "I had a four percent raise, so I'm going to raise my four hundred one k contribution one percent or two percent." And you'll never notice if you do it. No. Like if you do it one percent or two percent at a time annually, you're never even going to notice the difference in your lifestyle. But you will notice a difference if you never do that and you just, it's always lifestyle creep. I'm going to give you a great personal example, okay? Forever I had a solo 401k. So I was responsible. It wasn't automatic ACH. It's like, okay, I make 401k contributions when I want to. I do a profit sharing contribution at the end of September. Well, I'd always save money in it, but I wasn't always maxing it out. I'd always max out my profit sharing because I knew that was coming, but there'd be times like, oh, I wanna do this, so I won't send the contribution check. Well, I switched to a regular 401k where it's all automatic payroll deduct, so I max them out every year, my profit sharing. Guess what? It's probably easier now. It's easier, because you're just and doing I save it. more money. I never see the money. I always yeah. had the money to save, I just waited to do one big contribution. Well, now it's just every two weeks, coming out, don't even know it's there. Yeah. And see, I really like <clears throat> on this topic, I like weekly contributions for myself personally. Well, like, I do. You know me. I do weekly contributions yeah. in all of my accounts. I mean, I make multiple weekly contributions. And the reason is the amount of money I'm saving would be painful if I took it one time a month. But when I spread it out over the course of every week, I barely know what's coming out. Yeah. So uh, between weekly contributions and then even like stuff like biweekly payments and stuff like that. To me, it just it's easier to manage a budget one week at a time than one month at a time. Well, but I've always been like that. I'll be honest. Biweekly payments are undervalued in the real estate world. And part of it is we've been in this and people don't know what biweekly payments are. It means you're making a payment every payment every other week. Well, if you think about payments in general, if you make it monthly, there's 12 payments a year. If you do biweekly you end up making two extra mortgage payments a year because there's 26 right. weeks. Right, so you're paying like there's 13 months. It cuts seven years off your loan. Which is significant. Seven years. Yeah. It wasn't important when interest rates were 2 and 3%. We're running back to 6 and 7% on mortgage rates. This actually should become an important tool for people to do. Make biweekly payments and just start shaving off this mortgage, but people won't do it, even though they're never going to miss it. If you get paid, bi- think about this. If you get paid biweekly, why wouldn't you do a biweekly mortgage payment? You should. You should. This makes it easier to manage. Yeah, you're getting an extra paycheck, right? You're getting two extra paychecks here by doing biweekly. 
Well, I'll get back to the original topic of lifestyle creep. Some lifestyle creep's okay, but don't get ahead of yourself with the lifestyle creep. Get settled in. Try to pay cash for this stuff. I had a meeting with somebody the other day, and the exact words, I'm gonna, I want to buy this. Well, why? Well, everybody else has one. That was the exact words of the like this person I was meeting with. Everyone they told has me that, one. They told me what they wanted to buy, and they could afford it if they they could pay cash if they saved up for twelve months. Well, I want to get it now. Husband wants to be debt free. Wife wants it now. I said, "Well, why do you want it? Well, everybody has one. That doesn't mean you have to have one. Can't you? You'll be everyone in twelve months, and you'll have it. Just and yours will be paid for. Yeah. <clears throat> so you know, some lifestyle creeps okay, but just make sure it's going to like the appropriate the appropriate place. So, um, you know, for me. Growing up, Friends was like a pretty popular show that I watched a lot. Now, as I got older, there became another show that was really popular called The Office. But I think there's some good lessons here. And it's like some really ironic comedy. And it's about business in general. And the show revolves really around these cast members who work at this company called Dunder Mifflin Paper Company. And I'm sure you probably watch The Office more than Friends, right? Yeah, for sure. The Office is hilarious. That show's awesome. One of the the episodes that I actually remember it was called Scott's Tots, and um, the lesson we can learn from this one is dream big, but keep your financial goals attainable. And in what happens in this, Michael Scott, who's like I think he's the boss there, I believe everybody knows him. He he's been in a lot of other shows, um, but in an effort to look cool and get his name in the local paper, so we all know the person who wants the publicity and look cool. He promised a group of third graders that he would pay their college tuition if they graduated high school. It's quite the promise. Okay, so here's the first thing I want to do. He promised his own money or the company money. But those students are in the episode. Those students are now high schoolers. And Michael doesn't have the money to pay for the tuition. So I think really what happened here is Michael kind of made two mistakes. First, he set this unrealistic goal of what he could do. Like if he was going to pay for all of these kids college and they're in third grade, the appropriate thing would have been before he announced this, how much money am I going to need now? And what are the contributions going to be over the next nine years to cover tuition for this whole class? Um, and have a realistic goal and idea in mind instead of just saying, I'll pay for it. I mean, I'm thinking about just paying for my own kids college. So let's just say a $300 a month contribution would like make a dent in college for somebody um, between third grade and ninth grade, which arguably will it make some? Yeah, will it cover it all? No. Let's just say 300 a month. How many kids are in the average school class? And I don't know how many kids were in this class. 15. I think it. I was going to say like 25. Okay, 15 to 25, I'm sure, depending on where you go. Let's use 20 because I can do some easy round math. There you go, 20. 20 kids, and you're going to fund their college over the next nine years. And it's not even all of it. He promised the whole tuition. But at a minimum, he'd have to make a $6,000 per month contribution for the next nine years to cover college for these kids. So it's pretty easy to, like, you know, figure out real quick that wouldn't work. Um, so, you know, step one of all of this stuff is get a realistic goal, but then step two is you got to figure out, can you actually make the goal happen? It's like, if somebody tells me they want to spend $250,000 a year in retirement, but they're making 130,000, like, how did you come up with that number? That's not realistic. And why do you think you need twice the money in retirement as you do now? And I've had Maybe not that far off, but I've had people tell me they want to spend more in retirement than when they worked. Well, yeah, there's probably a disconnect in how how this actually works. But here's the beauty. If before we make a retirement decision, you meet with someone that says, hey, look, to get to here, you're going to have to contribute X. Reminds me of the FIRE movement, the show we just did. Most people underestimate how much money they're going to have to put away to hit their goal. So- Two things, takeaways from this, you know, don't set an unrealistic goal. But number two, if you set a goal, you have to figure out what the action steps are to actually accomplish that goal and make it come to fruition. 
so there was uh if people remember watching the arrested development and they have the the, the family has the banana stand where they sell frozen bananas and, and i think there's a, a lesson in this and it's really around emergency fund having an emergency fund having it somewhere that's probably a smart place to have it that's accessible that you can use it um and has the right amount of liquidity that a an emergency fund should have so the, the dad he's always says something like well you know, if times get tough, we can fall back on the banana stand. And what he meant was, and but the other family members didn't know this, what he meant was, I have money hidden in the walls of the building or the stand that, that they're selling the, the frozen bananas out of. And they thought it was just like a little small business generating a little revenue just in case bad stuff happened, right? If I remember this episode. Yes, yes. And then, um, so Michael, the son, he what he takes that as is oh if we essentially committed insurance fraud there'd be insurance money from the banana stand so he sets the thing on fire without knowing that there's a quarter million dollars stored and stored in the wall somewhere and hidden in there so up in flames goes the stand also the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars so you know to me that was kind of like for the dad, that was the emergency fund. Hey, if we really need money, I got it somewhere. Um, I think maybe having your emergency fund like in a bank where you can access it is a little more prudent than uh, hiding it in the walls or burying it in your backyard. You know, those are things you hear people talk about that. Oh, it's in the mattress. It's here. It's there. Um, you might just want to have a security a secure place for that. And then also the other, your other family members should know where that is too. Okay. hundred percent. Your family members need to know where it's at. Somebody does a trusted resource or two. And here's why I've had situations where clients have parents or grandparents who passed away and they are finding money in the freezer behind cabinets in sofas, like all these hiding spots, people are like, well, I'll hide my money there. But they never thought about how will people find it if I pass away. And you've seen like people who've bought homes on TV and they find like all this money in the walls or in the basement or somewhere like let people somebody know where this is, because at some point something's going to happen to you. And, and I want everybody to think about this. Nobody plans on dying suddenly. Nobody wakes up and says, hey, today's my day. It just happens. Yeah. So if you're saying, well, in the future, I'll do this. Well, maybe the future is today. You got to do it. So do you remember the family we had come in and they said, hey, we have some extra cash. Oh, my gosh. At the house. Yes. So and they're looking for an idea with what to do with the extra cash. And OK, well, how much? Well, I'm thinking they got twenty five, fifty thousand yeah, dollars. It was a safe. lot of money. Yeah like $400,000 in cash. How do you have $400,000 in cash? Well, they were Liria banks and they'd accumulated it and they'd pay tax on all the money. Like they'd done it on all their tax returns, everything. They just wanted to have it in a safe In a safe at the, like why, why much? Okay. Why that much? But here, I'm going to give you an example. I had someone the other day ask me about um, precious metals as an investment. And I said, well, one, like gold's actually volatile. If you go back and look at the price of gold, it's pretty volatile. I said, but I own some physical gold and silver and I have some cash in my house. And I, I said, it's not really for, and I don't, not a lot of it, just enough for this reason. I said, part of the reason I do it, it's my safety net. And when I say that people are thinking, oh, well, if the dollar crashes or all these like cataclysmic events. And I said, no, no, I have it. So if somebody steals my identity today, because I had this happen to a friend of mine in one day, they emptied, they emptied all of his bank accounts and maxed out every credit card in a day, in a day. Wow. And he lived in Washington, D.C. And he said, you don't understand when you have no credit cards, you can't get anywhere. You can't buy anything. I can't buy milk. I can't buy groceries. I have no cash. I have nothing. It's gone. And he got it all straightened out, but it was this inconvenient part of life. 
So from that day, I'm like, I'm always going to have enough to get me through like a week or two of bills and expenses to keep my family going if somebody wipes me out because it could happen. And I don't want dollars. I don't keep like a bunch of cash. And the reason is that's easy to go raid. Well, we're going to go out to dinner tonight. So let's grab a hundred dollars and take it for dinner. Pretty soon you don't have anything. It's a lot harder to exchange the actual like gold or silver coins. So, but if you absolutely needed it, you could get somewhere right. I keep and exchange it, I keep them. it in a safety deposit box at the bank. If I have to go get it, I can. It's out of sight, out of mind. But if somebody wiped me out, I could go to the bank and I could resume my life. I could take it to the coin shop. I could exchange the coin for dollars. I could go buy what I need to do. So I've created a, a safety net for myself in a different fashion. It has nothing to do with like an investment return. It's strictly about how do I make my life easy if this happens? Right. Well, it um, wouldn't be easy, but manageable. But yes, but guess point. what? I have it in a secure location. It's at the bank in a safety deposit box. Guess who else knows about it? My wife. She knows where it's at. Because what if something happens to me? Do we really want it sitting in a bank in a safety deposit box that nobody knows about? Have you considered hiding it in the walls of your home? No, <laughs> no part of me would ever do that because nobody's going to find it and it's going to become somebody else's. So with that said, this is a fun show. It kind of brings back, you know, a lot of good memories for me about my younger years, but I think, you know, what's in here is just a lot of really good, solid, you know, money advice that people can take away. I wouldn't call it investment advice, but money advice that people should think about. And when you're watching your next series or TV show, see if you can find some money things in there and learn something about it. You know, it's kind of interesting. Like there's all these lessons in these TV shows that we only see as entertainment, but there's actually things we can learn from it. You um, can, you can be entertained and learn at the same time. Yeah. It, it's That's great. really nice. So to wrap up today's show, you know, if, if you have a money lesson from a TV show that we didn't touch today, send us an email. You can get us at btwellshow.com. We didn't get into movies today, so if there's a lesson from a movie, you can send it to the email as well. Uh, please don't don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on our social media page. With that said, I want to thank everybody for listening, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>